This is Ryan and Michelle, and welcome to the Celebrate Marriage Cast, where we hope to restore and reclaim godly marriages through honest and real conversations. All right, welcome to episode 19. And again, we just want to tell you we're going to be talking about uh, some maybe sensitive subjects today. So if you are uh, a child or a kid, teenager listening, maybe just pause, ask your parents if, uh, if you know, it's okay to continue, and we'll, uh, we'll continue from there. Sounds great. And like Ryan said, welcome to episode 19. We have a guest with us today. And I'm going to tell you, you have probably heard of her. And I'm going to read kind of an extended bio because I really want you, our listeners, to know what a um, what she brings to the table as a guest today. And we're just so excited. So we want to welcome Shanti Feldhahn to our show. Shanti is a groundbreaking social researcher, best-selling author, public speaker, podcaster, wife, and mother. After receiving her master's degree from Harvard, she worked in Wall Street. Shanti now uses her analytical skills in conducting research studies to uncover and share the little things that make a big difference for thriving lives and relationships. Her books have been translated into over 26 languages. Ryan, that's incredible. And 3 million copies have been sold. More than that. Shanti's bestselling for women only and for men only, which she co-authored with her husband, Jeff, have transformed countless lives. These landmark books offer research-based simple aha moments. We have these books in our house. They're sitting here today. Such great aha moments that allow the reader to suddenly see and remove the obstacles to a great relationship. Shanti's conversational, innovative way of sharing these findings have been featured in other books, such as Thriving in Love and Money, The Kindness Challenge, The Surprising Secrets of Highly Happy Marriages, The Good News About Marriage for Parents Only, The Male Factor, and now Secrets of Sex and Marriage. Wow, Shanti, that is quite the resume. We are so glad to have you on our show. Welcome to you. Uh, thanks so much. I'm really, really delighted to be with you. I'm so excited your church does this podcast. That's such a great way of equipping marriages. It's just awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Shanti, we want to we wanna introduce uh, this, this book, Secrets of Sex and Marriage. Uh, One, this is a fantastic book, and I would recommend everybody pick up a copy. It's so good. Um, But The Secrets of Sex and Marriage offers really revealing findings from the Marriage Intimacy Project, a study of 5,300 individuals about the most intimate aspects of their relationships. So the research includes the largest nationally representative survey ever conducted with married couples about sex. Wow. Wow which is awesome. So Feldham and Dr. Seitzma provide actionable knowledge and takeaways, including tips from Dr. Seitzma with more than 35 years of clinical experience. This is information readers can trust from both a scientific and a faith perspective. As one reader put it, this book was so helpful and down to earth. It was like a conversation with a friend. If your friend happens to be a pastor and a sex therapist, (laughs) Again, I can't say enough. The The book was so good. And I, I I love it because I have a very analytical mind. And like when somebody can kind of like speak my language about a topic of sex, awesome. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so um, we want to start off, Shanti. So what inspired really you to do this project and conduct this research to begin with? Well, it's it's interesting. For the last, uh, gosh, it's been 20 years now, wow. um, I've been conducting research, as you read in that <laughs> very long bio. Thank you <laughs> for that introduction. Um, and so I've been doing these um, nationally representative research studies, and a lot of them, not all of them, but quite a few of them circled around issues around marriage. Right. Like that's been one of the big um, areas that we've really (laughs) kind of dug into. And obviously, (laughs) when you're talking to thousands of couples about marriage, guess what topic tends to come up a lot as an issue that causes um, conflict or arguments or hurt feelings. And one of the the kind of the hallmarks of all the studies that we've done is that we're basically trying to dig out what are the little things that actually are going to make a big difference? Like if you only change this little thing or that little thing, it's like a small change, but over time, 
sometimes it can have a pretty significant impact. Oh, for sure. And so given that this area is so central to marriage, we're like, okay, we've got to stop avoiding this. <laughs> Right, right. We have to do this research project, even as awkward as that is, and me thinking, how am I going to be talking to people about this? <laughs> um, but it was important, so. That's so cool. And you said, it, so it was 5,300 individuals that were part of that study? Yeah. That's incredible. That's a really good survey pool. Yeah, we had we had such an interesting way of conducting the research for this one um, because you know we always do we kind of conclude our research with these you know these big nationally representative surveys which we did this time as well but early on in the research normally <laughs> with our other projects like when we're studying parenting or money in marriage or kind of some of the inner you know lives of men and women or whatever you know I will like interview just tons of random people that you know whoever I'm sitting next to on the airplane sure. like I just want to hear like what they're thinking and I'm like if we did that on this topic like we would have needed a line item in our budget for bail money <laughs> So, so for this one, we actually had a really, really fun time with the research uh, because like Jeff and I, we put out the word that we wanted to talk to just random average couples that we would never get a chance to talk to otherwise. But because of kind of the awkwardness, it was like, okay, we'll, how about we do a Zoom interview with you with your camera blacked out? So you can sure. see us. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can't mm -hmm. see you. We have no idea who you are. And you use a fake name. Sure. And so that's the way we did a lot of the initial interviews. So we talked wow. to a lot of couples named Wanda and Vision. <laughs> <laughs> Han and Leia. Yeah, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so cool. A different approach for that study then, for sure. Yes, for sure. Shanti, what is the most surprising or maybe the most important thing or a few things that the marriage intimacy study revealed? Well, probably the most, from what we can tell, um, the most impactful so far um, is something that causes so many heartaches and arguments that people don't realize is going on. Um, because we have expectations of how sex and intimacy just works, like how this is the way it just functions. And we don't realize a lot of that is like from Hollywood. Yeah. Um, like we have these concepts in our head of, and you know, everybody listening to this, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Like if you see a movie where a couple is like interested in this, it's like they look at each other and there's this spark or this hunger <laughs> and pretty soon they're like kissing and the clothes are off and they're in bed. And if it doesn't look like that in your house, mm -hmm. <laughs> it can feel kind of, what's wrong with me? Like, yeah. why doesn't my yeah. spouse desire me that way? Or yeah. why don't I desire my spouse that way? Like you mm -hmm. feel like something's broken. And one of the most important pieces of the puzzle for this project is actually demonstrating and quantifying that what you see in the sort of the Hollywood view of it, that's one type of desire, but there's actually two. There are two primary types of desire. You could call that kind of Hollywood feeling that kind of hunger for it where you think about it and like you do something about it you could call that initiating desire because you sure desire to initiate but there's a completely other type of desire called receptive desire and the person with receptive desire literally the physiology works in the reverse order and the person with receptive desire generally they don't feel that sense of hunger Right? right? And instead, they make a decision to get mm. engaged with their spouse in that way. And then as they get going, you know, assuming that it's a positive experience, right? Like we're assuming goodwill in the marriage and that kind of thing. 
But as, as they get going, then suddenly they start feeling the sense of desire that maybe their spouse felt five or 10 minutes ago. Sure. Like act your way into a feeling. <laughs> yes. And it's, it, both those types of desire are totally legitimate. They're just completely different. Hmm. And it probably won't surprise people to learn that, um, 73% of women have receptive desire. And now, of course, that means there's a whole cohort of women who have initiating desire or whatever. Um, but it it's really, really profound. Once a couple goes, wait a minute, I'm not broken or my spouse isn't broken. This is literally a different type of physiology. Sure. So what do you do with that then, knowing that potentially the wife might have receptive, um, de- what did you call it? Receptive, receptive desire. Desire. Yeah. desire. And then the maybe the husband or vice versa might have right. initiative desire or vice versa. Maybe the spouses are different. What are, did you give practical <laughs> tips in or can you give us some tips? Yes. Yeah, so we interviewed a lot of people to try to figure out what were the, what were the best ways of kind of addressing this? So, by far the largest number, the largest percentage of couples, one person has initiating and one person has receptive. That's the the largest um, kind of pattern. And, and then the next largest is both of them have receptive desire. Okay. Um, which is, so it's ironic. Right. Both couples mm-hmm. have initiating desire what we think is 100% of couples <laughs> because of wow. what we see in Hollywood, that's only right. 10% yeah. of couples. Right. Wow. So 10%. most couples need to kind of act their way into a feel or kind of so, like take some purposeful steps then. Yeah. So here's what we found for that um, sort of the majority that have where one person has initiating one receptive. The, the most... Um, impactful, useful, practical tip that um, tends, not always, but tends to work for people is to give the person with receptive desire, the initiating desire spouse, give the person with receptive desire um, anticipation time. And so like, you know, flirting, flirting with them in the morning (laughs) in the kitchen about what you'd love to have happen later that night. Um, and you know, it's really cold in here. Well, how about I warm you up, warm you up later? (laughs) Um, you know, something, just some comment, something so that the receptive desire spouse can start thinking about it and anticipating it as opposed to what the normal, the physiology of that person is being surprised by it and then having to kind of, you know, suddenly kind of, you know, address this, which, for the person with the initiating desire spouse feels a lot like rejection, right? Like, why would you have to think about it? (laughs) Sure. Like, shouldn't you just be longing to tear my clothes (laughs) off? And, and the reality is actually, no, they're not thinking about it, which I know sounds crazy to you, Mr. or Miss, you know, initiating desire person. Um, But they're probably not thinking about it. It's probably their physiology is not, hungering for that. And so getting them thinking about it and anticipating it can change everything about the dynamic. So that one tip is a big one. Um, Another one, which is actually good for that dynamic or for the couples where both parties have receptive desire. Um, Because, you know, the joke is if both people have receptive desire, what do you do? sit around and look at each other? <laughs> right. <laughs> what, how's that going to work? And so another one that, another um, initiative, something that really actually works really well is scheduling. Um, mm-hmm. That's something that people are like, wow, that's not spontaneous. That's not romantic. But it actually can be. Like this is to actually say, well, you know, every Wednesday night while the kids are at Awana, <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> and that's what you plan on. Right. And so you're actually looking forward to it. So it is a type of anticipation time, but it's just scheduled. Sure. So anyway, those are just two ideas, but those have been found to work pretty well. Yeah, that's really yeah. great. I, 
I think that's such an important conversation to to have because I I think there probably is a lot of conflict around this. You have an initiator, you have a receptor, and like part of that, you know, I I'm not going to assume because I think a person could be either one. Um, but uh, you know, if if we look at probably stereotypical, um, I'm going to say male probably is the initiator. You know, usually, and, statistically, that's usually the case. Yeah, yeah, and and if if your wife is is you know receptive desire, this is a really key point to to understand that that this takes like you have to kind of start this process. Mm. You know, yeah, it's not fan like the yeah, you yeah. have to fan that flame. You can't just be like take your clothes off and be like, hey, ready? <laughs> like. <laughs> It does, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, this, yeah. It, it takes, you know, it takes, uh, it starts that morning. It starts, you know, it's yeah. like, it really is a process. Checking in throughout the day, maybe a text message. Or a text message, a flirty comment, dinner. something like that along along the way. Yeah. Well, but it's such an I, important, yeah. Can I, can I jump in? Here's where it gets misunderstood. Because let's just say stereotypically... You are um, at a, you know, marriage event at your church or you're reading a book on marriage or whatever. And stereotypically, and there's a reason behind the stereotype where the husband does tend to be more likely to be the initiating. The wife does tend to be more likely to be the receptive, right? Like that's pretty common. Um, But stereotypically, what the husbands are told is, you know, you need to pay attention to her throughout the day. You need to do the chores. You need to help with the kids. You need to be loving and caring. All of that is true, but it doesn't address the physiology. And so you can be scrubbing the toilets, and that's awesome, but is she (laughs) thinking about sex? No. Right. (laughs) Right. Or or if it's the reverse, maybe he's the receptive desire in that marriage, and is he thinking? No. Like, it's... (laughs) It's yeah, that's just part of it, sharing the household chores, right? <laughs> right. Like that's just everyday right. oh, stuff. That's so yeah. sweet, you know. And so that's the the, the step that a lot of people mm. just aren't aware of that it is so so crucial. So being a little more direct, maybe with being it. Um, giving that anticipation time, yeah, whatever that looks like, giving the anticipation time. I think what's interesting, Shanti, that you said too is that the initiative spouse can then see that as rejection. And then if that happens a few times, like that could be really just kind of, I mean, I could see someone taking that personal or wonder, you know, is it me or what's wrong, whatever, but it's just physiological differences, like you said. It it is, well, and it's actually, Michelle, it's really good you mentioned that because you say, you know, what do you do about this, the fact that there are these two primary types of desire. And there's another type of desire as well, but it's just a very small percentage of people. So we tend to focus on these two. Um, but, you know, when you talk about what to do, it's not just about, hey, what do you do? Like give your spouse anticipation time or schedule it or whatever. It's also what you do internally in your own heart mm-hmm. and in your own mind because you have these expectations and beliefs and insecurities that are in there. And I know for most, we've done so many surveys, not just for this book, but for others. We've done so many surveys of people who have initiating desire where it, this usually intimacy is at the core of how they feel about themselves. And if I, I am not desirable. It's almost a sense of depression, right? It's this sense of, you know, if my being stereotypical, you know, my wife finds a pillow and a magazine to read more interesting than me. Like, what does that say about me as a, as a person, as a spouse? And so one of the things that's crucial is to, Actually take those thoughts captive. You talk about taking thoughts captive in many other contexts. That is a really important one. Um, to take those thoughts captive and say, no, this is literally just a different wiring. And it means that I need to approach my spouse differently. And, 
And once you kind of come to terms with that, there's almost an acceptance process, almost like a grieving, but I want my wife to tear my clothes off. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I, and maybe some women, that's, you know, a part of who they are. But for some people, you know, if they're receptive desire, that may not be a, really a part of who they are. And so kind of accepting that is crucial. And then on the flip side, the the other half of this, though, is that the person with receptive desire has a responsibility as well to say, this is important for my marriage. This is important for my spouse and for me. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't think about it as often. And so there, I have a responsibility to think about it more often. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I've had different people, including receptive desire men, you know, have told me that they make little notes in their like calendar about, you know, I'm not going to be thinking about it. So I see the note and it gets me thinking, oh, yeah. it's been a few days, yeah. you know, like it gets yeah. me thinking about it. So there's really, truly an internal reckoning with this on both sides as well. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Last week we talked about, we talked with Debbie Wade, who is a sex addiction therapist. And mm. we talked about pornography. If you missed that episode, we definitely would encourage you to go back. It was so, so good. Um, yeah. Not shaming, not condemning, just so educational, so helpful, so hope-giving. Um, but one of the things that we talked about in that is committing to abstain, abstaining from pornography also means that I want to make sure we're meeting each other's needs. You know, that... that there's no unmet needs. So it's just being aware of, you know, whether it's how many days or whatever, but just checking in with each other and being, you know, cognizant of that and, um, you know, just, just having that top of mind. So. Yeah. You, what you're mentioning is, what you're mentioning is, is one example of um, everybody's got an individual story right? Like everybody has, there's a different story in every individual marriage and whatever it is that's going on in your marriage, just be aware that sometimes learning this stuff, being aware of it, keeping your eye open for it, learning what you can do rather than putting it all on your spouse, it can be, I mean, the changes can be dramatic um, like for just, I'll give you an example because we've interviewed plenty of people where pornography was an issue. And one of the things when, you, you know, you mentioned is sort of being aware of um, trying not to have unmet needs. <clears throat> that could be an awareness on the part of the spouse who has the higher desire um, that maybe their spouse needs space for some reason. Right. Like maybe the, the emotions of the pornography have really need to be wrestled with. Like yeah. I can't, you know, you've been looking at this and I think you're fantasizing every time we're intimate and I need to wrestle through that. And maybe that spouse goes, I get it. Right. So that yeah. need is met in a different way. There's just, there's so many different stories. There's sure. no one. Um, you know, right example, but I love, you know, I love what it sounds like your therapist friend said last time that it's about being aware, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's yeah. so yeah. crucial. Yeah. That's so good. I mean, I, I think that leads us into like the next question here, Shanti, about just how can couples improve communication in this area. I, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I love about the book. There's so many myths out there of like, <laughs> what's normal? What's okay? Um, you know, and, and so like, how, how can we improve communication between spouses in this, you know, in this topic? Well, one of the most, um, one of the most important central uh, kind of reckonings, I guess, sort of awarenesses. Is awarenesses a word? I don't know if that's a word. It is now. Hopefully, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> Hopefully you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, one of the most important understandings, let's just put it that way, understandings, is that we avoid communication um, because it's awkward to talk about. There's sometimes you think, well, nothing's going to change. There are these hurt feelings. You know, I don't even know how to talk about it because you think 
that what you're going to be talking about is, forgive me, is technique and body parts, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. in your head, that's what communication about intimacy amounts to. That's what you think it is. And that is not what the communication is about. The communication is about all of the stuff under the surface, how you think, how you're wired, how you feel in these areas, how you feel when, you know, I, I feel like you just spring this on me and, you know, that I don't want to not be with you, but here's what it feels like or how you feel when you feel abandoned or how you feel when, look, I, you know, I really need that and I feel valued when you give me time to think about it ahead of time. And what you're talking about is the stuff under the surface. Yeah. And that is actually, it's, it's easier to talk about in some ways. It's harder in other words, because it means you have to be attuned to it. Um, and you have to be thinking and able to articulate stuff, which can take a little bit of time. Um, but that starting point is so crucial is to not shy away from it and realize you're not talking about technique and body parts, yeah. right? You're, you're talking about you and I want to learn you and know more about you. And I want you to know more about me. And I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons we wrote the book the way we did so that like a couple could literally read it together and read it out loud to each other. Um, and you know, we, we had, <laughs> We had one couple who we did a podcast with right after the book came out. And they told us that their thing, one of the things they loved doing as a couple was they were always reading some book or another together. And they would read, you know, two or three pages and talk about it. And, you know, that would be kind of 10, 15 minutes in the evening. And she said, we started your book and we got two or three sentences. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> Before we had to stop and go, is this how you feel? Whoa, like wow. I never knew what, you know, <laughs> and, and that's the key is it's not just about this book, right? Find resources that you can talk through together and that will really help with communication. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good, Shanti. Thank you for sharing that story. I love that. And just not even being able to get further into the book, that makes me chuckle. Yeah, so that's it's really fun. good. Yeah, it's really good to good. do as a couple then. Absolutely. Yeah. So Shanti, obviously there's so much to the book here and we really just kind of skimmed the surface today, but what else can a, can couples expect to learn in the book and also where can they get it? Well, what they can expect to learn is kind of the, re- the results of this nationally representative uh, research project that was trying to dig out the most common issues, right? The things that tend to affect most couples in most cases, most of the time. Um, And of course, that means there's plenty of things it can't cover that are more specialized. But the idea is, again, to try to figure out what are the little things that make a big difference, right? And so that's what we were focusing on. And so I hope that that's helpful. And you can get it, you know, wherever books are sold, um, but one other thing, actually, that might be helpful, um, if this is stirred up in you, wow, it's not just about the book. Like, I feel like we need a lot extra help in this area because that's not uncommon yeah. where you do have issues like pornography or sexual pain or things that are specialized, like my depression medicines reduce my libido or what, you know, whatever those things are, um, one of the things that might be helpful is because Dr. Seitzma is a highly, highly regarded sex therapist who has actually trained most of the Christian sex therapists out there wow. um, in one way or another. Um, we put together a website that's the same as the book title. So secrets of sex and marriage.com. And on the website, there are a bunch of other articles and things that do go further into those specific, more specialized areas. And you can find some referral resources to um, trusted therapists that specialize in this area. Awesome. We can put those in our show notes too. That's fantastic. Good. That's great. That's great. Well, Shanti, as we wrap up here, we ask our guests, we ask all of our guests three questions, sort of rapid fire. 
So I'm going to set my watch here. We're just going to plan on three minutes and just, okay. like I said, just kind of rapid fire here. Um, but what, why is marriage important to you? What's your okay. marriage? Why? I am going to, I am going to answer that question as a marriage researcher. Okay. okay. Yes. Love it. So as a marriage researcher, the reason it's important to me is that it, it is at the central nexus of human thriving. Hmm. Um, every study that has ever been done, and this, by the way, this is not hyperbole, this is accurate. Any demographer, any sociologist will tell you that all of the issues of society, ultimately, whether it's crime or this or that or the other thing, they all trace back to does, is there a healthy marriage? Is there a healthy family? And if you have that, that the chances of poverty are lower, the chances of drug abuse are lower, the chances of all these other things that really hurt our, our flourishing as people, the abundant life yeah. wow. that God has for us. And so it's not like a perfect magic button. Obviously, marriage itself can be a cause for hurt and concern and hardship and working, you know, hard on stuff. But in general, that's wow. why wow. marriage wow. is important. Yeah. That's so good. And Shanti, best date night. So <laughs> my best date night, I'll answer that one for, for me. You're going to involve research. <laughs> <laughs> Je no, <laughs> Je Jeff and I, but, but you still might laugh at this because Jeff and I actually speak at a lot of marriage conferences, right? A lot of churches, marriage events. And so we're always going somewhere really interesting where it's like, okay, you know, we're done with the event. Where are we going to go to dinner? Never been to this town before. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> right. Right. Where is a cool restaurant? And, you know, people are always very excited to help us, like, explore the favorite restaurant in yeah. town. So yeah. that's kind of fun. Awesome. Super fun. Awesome. And then lastly, what's bringing you joy in your marriage right now? So Jeff and I, what one of the things that we love to do, which people think we're so weird, but it just... It's just the way it works. Is we actually have had for years now a pattern of having coffee together in the morning. Like, you know, we have a bazillion things to do about the day. And it's one of those things like with the kids, when the kids were younger, we would, you know, scramble around, get the kids off to school. And then we'd just sit there for like half an hour. We'd have our coffee. We read the news and, ooh, did you see this thing that happened? You know, it, I know it sounds silly because it's not like we're staring into each other's eyes <laughs> right. or having deep conversation, but <laughs> it's something that brings us joy. That's so good. Shanti, you shared where we can buy the book. We'll put a link to that in our show notes. Where else can our listeners keep up with your, you and your ministry and follow along? Oh, you're so sweet. Well, our main website where we tend to put everything is Shanti.com. Okay. And one of the things that I encourage people to do, we we actually spend a lot of time and effort and money and resources each week to create an equipping blog. And it's just our gift. It's totally free. But it's um, of each week is something that we've done research on and we want to share with people. That's super cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'm excited for us to get those links in the notes too. Yeah. I, I love, Shanti, just one last thing here. I love what you said about, you referenced this a couple of times about the micro changes. And I hope that our listeners are encouraged and inspired to grab the book and read it as a couple. Because if you think about all these little micro changes, we've talked about this with our vision boards for the year and stuff, but, um, and even some health goals and such. But I mean, if you're making little micro changes, that changes the trajectory of your whole year and your yes. years. And even, you know, you'll, uh, I feel like this is an old tale of some sort, but the plane that was one degree off or a half yes. of a degree off and ended up yeah. halfway across, you know, around the world in the wrong spot. I mean, over the course of a lifetime, these little changes are really important. So I hope that people feel hope in hearing them Absolutely. and they can implement yeah. some. So yeah, I th well just just so you guys know statistically because this is the kind of stuff we nerds quantify. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are we actually had one project where we just had people do three little things differently every day. Like little little simple things. Sure. And we found that 89% of relationships immediately improved. It wasn't wow. even over a lifetime. Yeah. It was like wow little simple stuff and 
pretty big changes pretty quickly. So wow. I hope that's encouraging too. That is super yeah. hope giving. Yeah, and absolutely. Shanti, you're joining us back for Five Minute Friday, correct? Yes, All absolutely. Right. Great. Well, thank you, Shanti, so much for joining <laughs> us on the Celebrate Marriage Cast. Yeah. And thank you to our listener for joining us today at the Celebrate Marriage Cast. We'll post Shanti's links, like we said, in our show notes. And additionally, if you would like any additional help for your marriage, visit us at celebrate.church slash marriage. Additionally, we are finding ways to connect with our listeners more so. Ryan, we're going to tell them about something new. Oh, Do you what's know what that? it is? No. We have a call line. Oh, all right. I may have left the first review and it said oh, how is, handsome you were. Oh, that's super um, nice. So maybe, <laughs> just to test it out. Nice. But I thought maybe they would play it, but they knew it was for mm, me. So maybe I'll read it next week. You should read it next yeah, or okay. play it next week. But right. so here's the deal. You can call in. We just want to hear. We want to hear your takeaways. This is episode 19. We've been doing this for, you know, twice a week now. And we just want to hear if you've had some groundbreaking change or even a micro change, would you please call and let us know? It is a voicemail service. It's nobody's going to answer it. Nobody's going to ask you about your marriage or drill you on <laughs> questions. You can just call in, you'll hear the recording prompt, and then you can leave whatever message and share what you want. We would love to play that on the show then too. And it's it can be totally anonymous too. So that number is 605-951-0110. Celebrate Marriage Cast phone number 605-951-0110. And we would love to hear from you and we will look forward to that. So um, have a great week and it's been great to have you with us again, Shanti. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, it's Michelle from Sioux Falls. I just have to say, Brian's so handsome.